Welcome everyone uh, to Making IGs Implementable. And here is your speaker, Gino Canessa. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Halfway through some of the other sessions, I know that's tough, so appreciate uh, not making me talk into the void. That's always nice. Uh, and welcome to what I think will be my most controversial and uh, debated session, even though it's short. Um, Minutia wise, uh, aka.ms slash genoc slash dex, you can see all this and everything going back since I started working on Fire in 2019, all the different things that you can watch if you like. It should be in Whova as well, though I did submit it late, so if it's not, it'll get there. Uh, for the agenda, the obligatory about me, disclaimer, some context, some considerations, and then hopefully some time for discussion. Uh, I will admit that I forgot this was a short session uh, until uh, earlier this week, and so I pared down my slides a fair bit, but I'll do my best. Uh, again, I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I work in research, healthcare standards and interop, infrastructure, tooling, code gen, spec development, uh, fun stuff for that, uh, DICOM for a couple decades before that, and contact information that you can find on the slide deck if you want to get a hold of me. Uh, so disclaimer, uh, I laugh about this, I'm not a lawyer, but I did marry one, so all of my decks have disclaimers. Um, this is gonna have tips and thoughts, there's no silver bullet for all of this stuff, it's a complicated space, it's a big space, uh, so this is me presenting my perspectives. Uh, they gave me a mic, so that's what you all have to deal with. Uh, and even to that point, uh, yesterday I had a talk on code generation from implementation guides, kind of attacking the same problem from the opposite side. So it's a huge space, lots of stuff to do there. So the first thing I wanna talk about is target audience. Uh, so as an IG author, when you're writing something, uh, obviously you're writing it for someone. And the for someone, as humans, I do the same thing, we often think of ourselves first. Okay, well, we're not really our own audience, but yeah, we, uh, most of us can get past that. Um, when we're talking about IGs in particular, though, we have this useful hint that's baked into the name, implementation guide. And that's because at some point, your IG has to be implemented via software. A lot of authors uh, in discussions kind of argue that point. They're like, no, my IG is for other IGs to consume. Great, unless they're gonna restate every single thing you have in your IG, the software developer still has to come back to yours and figure out how to implement it. So even if you're building these layers of IGs and all these other things, you're getting back to a software developer who has to write code to do what you're describing. And so who's doing that? Um, I'm making a joke at myself up there. Instead of sources, here's Copilot. Uh, this is something I did research for a similar, or a roughly similar topic a few years ago. I didn't feel like doing all that research. <laughs> uh, the important line is the one there at the end, bolded. Uh, most developers have two to five years of experience. So when you think of all software developers in all the world, over 50% of them have five years or less of experience developing software. And we can get in all the whys and stuff, we can talk later, but essentially you look at graduation rates, people entering the industry, all the boot camps, all these different things. You look at people who get promoted from developer to manager. Uh, you look at people who get promoted from developer to retired. Uh, you know, take off on sailing boats and never return. Uh, and this has been consistent for at least a decade. So. I'm calling this the fire pit, just because I thought it was fun. Uh, we get our very own ivory tower. And um, that's to say we come to all these events, dev days, connectathons, workgroup meetings, we hang out in Zulip, we have workgroup calls, we do all these things. And everyone we interact with, by and large, is a senior person, right? These are the people that companies trust to go represent them at these events. They trust the investment of the travel, of the attendance, of all these things, for someone to go back and learn things and bring it back and teach everyone else. So people reviewing ballots, that's another big one. Everyone's like, oh, we'll get ballot feedback. You know, the people who do ballot feedback, <laughs> those are the experts at any given company. There are, there are not, you know, a lot of things. But when it comes time to implement your guide, that senior person is gonna hand it to someone that, uh, their intern that just started, you know, a couple weeks ago here in the US, and it's gonna be their intern project. 
they're not an expert. So these people are outside your circle. And uh, that's uh, for people who are in XKCD, uh, that's 2501, I think. Uh, that it's uh, experts always overestimate what other people know about their stuff. And so this is not unique to us in fire. This is not unique to us in healthcare. Uh, but the differential between that. And I do want to make an important point here is, you know, especially at events like this, we have a lot of first time people, new people here. And we talk a lot about what the experts have to offer these new people. And I try to uh, really drive home the point the new people have something very valuable to offer the experts. And that is your first impressions. No matter how hard we try, once you've been doing this for a few years and once you've been authoring and building and doing all these systems, you cannot bring the new person perspective. So however expert you are, you will never get that back. So I encourage everyone who is new to please provide that feedback. Uh, whatever you think, you read an IG and you're saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. Tell us. <laughs> we need to know that because we can't tell anymore. Uh, and then if you are an experienced person, when you see the new people, ask them. You know, uh, generally the new people are just as kind and friendly and willing to help. And that's something that we have to make sure we stay on top of. So I'm going to jump around a little. Like I said, I shortened my slides. Uh, and thank you, Copilot, for my icon because I, could, I was going to draw something and I didn't have time. And I was very happy with this. Uh, so narrative versus computable. This is an argument. I've even had this argument this week talking about just even in source code. Um, and it's a perennial argument that no one will ever win because we're all different people. Uh, that said, I'm right. So I'm going to say you need both. <laughs> uh, and the reason why is because computable gives you how something happens and some of the what happens, but it can't tell you any of the why. And especially when you look at a lot of bugs that happen in software are things like inverted if statements, checking for not equals instead of an equals, uh, using ands instead of ors or vice versa, all these things. That line of code is a correct line of code. It's just not what you are trying to do. And you can't get that from reading the code. You need a comment saying, check to see if this is what I'm looking for. OK, yeah, now I can look at that if and I can see if it's actually checking to see what I'm looking for. Uh, and so you need both. And this is particularly tricky in the IG context because some things we have very good computable definitions for. Some things we're working on. Uh, Richard Etma had a good talk earlier this week. I don't know what day it is because I don't know what day today is. Um, and it was talking about uh, some of the test script and test plans and things like that that we're really working on getting these computable artifacts. Fantastic. Things like search parameters, computables built right in, perfect. Things like operation definition, completely useless. There's no good computable artifact. Because the artifact is just defining the interface. It tells you your inputs. It tells you your outputs. That's all operation definition has. And it makes sense. You know, how would you describe bulk data computably? I don't know what your data store looks like. I don't know what your web API surface looks like. I don't know what your file store looks like. I can't describe that computably. So I need to write narrative. And that narrative needs to have lots of examples and all these different things. And it's still challenging. So what you really need are reference implementations. Uh, and this is one of the things that I, uh, this is a philosophical debate, uh, I, I think. But I will present my philosophy, and people can feel free to tear it apart later. Uh, and I'm going to break things into three buckets. So the first one is the prototype, mock, proof of concept, whatever you want to call it stage. Um, these are things that you're asking the question, does this make sense? Uh, if I set up, you know, if I want to send you this piece of data, is that the data you need to give me the response I want? Um, can I actually send you this data? Do we have some sort of infrastructure, some transport mechanism to do all these things? These are pretty high level. They actually have very low technical requirements, especially these days in the age of co-pilots and no code and everything. It's fantastic. I put these things, uh, a lot of things like the Postman, when you set up a Postman server that always responds with good data, whatever request you send it, you, know, you hit this endpoint and it's going to respond with this. You're not evaluating search parameters. You're not evaluating an operation. But you're testing the workflow. Good stuff, necessary, uh, don't get me wrong, but it's not a reference implementation. The next bucket is reference implementations. And that's where you start saying, does this work? 
Uh, and to me, that needs to be an iterative process with at least two implementers, ideally. I will admit, it often can't happen. There's, in most reference implementations I write, I end up writing both the client and the server versions. But you find all kinds of bugs later when someone starts using it. Because you say, oh, this extension was supposed to be a value URI and I used a value string. But since I wrote the client and the server, <laughs> I had no idea. I just, that's my definition and I had it wrong in my head. And so these types of things, you need to make sure you're iterating and you're using, you know, working with other people. One of the most controversial things I'll say here is that it's not generally appropriate for production. And that's because you want tools and uh, error messages and all kinds of things that aren't appropriate in a production server. And I'll show a couple examples here in a second. But the perennial one I use is like when you're doing anything security, smart app launch, right? A production server is not going to tell you, hey, your token was malformed, here's how it was, and here's how you can fix it. <laughs> uh, that would be a, a very poor production implementation for a security uh, product. Uh, and so it's just going to maybe tell you an error, maybe not even tell you an error, maybe let you keep going and just return you no data. And that you can't develop against that. The last one is production implementations, and that's answering the question, you know, does this scale? You're doing streamlined, you're doing efficient, you're doing secure, you're doing all these different things to make sure. So I have a couple of demo screenshots. I don't want to do the demos because this is short. Uh, but this is from the Smart App Launcher. And when you go through the Smart App Launch flow, like the uh, standalone app uh, launch patient flow, this is the kind of screen you end up with. It has all kinds of information about the server, about your token, about the scopes, about everything you could want in there so that you can develop and debug and te test against it. While you're going through that flow, you can ask it to simulate errors, tell you that your token was expired, tell you that you, you know, gave a garbage pixie code, different things like that. These aren't things you can put in production, but as a developer, you need to know what errors can happen, what to do when that happens, all that kind of stuff. Another one, this is from the subscriptions reference implementation, uh, and this is kind of a walkthrough step-by-step -step that's in the UI that lets you build a subscription, explains every element uh, as you're building it up, what the different resources are, links to them so that you can see the JSON or XML versions, all this kind of stuff, and people have specifically told me this was great because they'd make a subscription and compare it to see what they were doing right or wrong, and since the server accepts subscriptions, then they can actually test them in real time. Not something I would put in production. <laughs> I don't know why you would ever consider it. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna try and speed through here so that we can have at least a couple minutes to talk. Um, common pitfalls, you know, operations, we talked about a fair bit already. Uh, incorrect and valid constraints on profiles. Uh, that's something we're working on tooling all the time, but uh, this kind of pairs with untestable or unrealistic assertions. A lot of times people look at a fire path constraint and they're like, well, I don't know how to write it. We'll get someone to do it later and put true so that uh, IG Publisher will build. Okay, well, that's great, <laughs> uh, but it's not actually testable and it's not something we want. Uh, and again, I mentioned earlier, but really try to guard against the tribal knowledge. Uh, most IGs are not published in a day. And so after you've been involved with a project for one, two, three, five years, there's a lot of implicit knowledge in that group. So again, take advantage of newcomers. That sounded wrong. <laughs> Utilize newcomers uh, to get that uh, feedback. So recommendations, implement. Ah, I'm just kidding. Uh, actual recommendations. Uh, think about implementers. Uh, and this is something I wanna mention explicitly, but you wouldn't write a clinical IG without clinical feedback. So think of implementers as uh, subject matter experts, SMEs, right? Consult with an implementer to make sure that you're getting that feedback as you're building your IG. It's part of it. Uh, build reference implementations, again, specific call out. Uh, when you're contracting, make sure you include things like give me feedback, tell me what's right, tell me what's wrong, tell me where you had to guess. Uh, I'm a developer. If you say here's a suitcase full of money, if you can make a reference implementation for this, you will get back a reference implementation. <laughs> I don't care how much stuff I have to make up, I don't care, you know, all that stuff. It's a suitcase full of cash, of course I'm gonna make it work. Um, and then try to identify those key places to reach outside your typical circle. And with that, hopefully we still have a couple more minutes. I specifically asked people to come, yeah, five minutes, uh, ready to discuss and ask questions and whatever, so please do so. Isaac. 
If it's a short question, I can repeat it too. So whichever way works. No, that's why. I, uh, yep. Yeah. So do you know you didn't um, distinguish between sandbox and reference or sandbox and reference implementation? And I think that like a lot of the stuff that you showed really is both and yes. kind of encompasses both. And and as like we as HL7 rolls out the foundry, I think like that maybe making that distinction I think might be helpful within the community. Can you talk about uh, the considerations between those two different like purposes of yes. open source projects? Yeah. Um, that's a great question, thank you. And to me, those are on different axes. So you might have a sandbox that is a prototype because you can stand up a sandbox that just has a mocking server in it and does that. You could stand up a sandbox that is a reference implementation. And we can create sandboxes of production implementations. So to me, those are orthogonal uh, in that we're saying a sandbox is, for lack of a better term, a deployment consideration for how do you spin up a system that has these features and has this test data and is available publicly so that people can test and all those things. And it might be any of those things up and down the stack. Generally, I would like to see mostly reference implementations there, uh, but uh, you know that's just personal preference. Uh, so does that answer enough? Yeah. Okay, awesome, thank you. I'll be the person who says, I still don't understand the difference between a sandbox and a reference implementation. Oh, of course. So when I talk about a reference implementation, let me see if I can actually back up here. Yeah, so this will work. So for instance, um, the smart app launcher is a reference implementation. There is technically a way to run it as a sandbox. Uh, in that you can go and get your Docker image and you can preload a server and put the test data you want in it and go through the configuration and do all those things to run it locally. Great. But there is one place for them and I see Isaac looking at me because he's considering a slight different term of sandbox and there, yes, you know, we, we should define an ontology for this. Uh, <laughs> but um, I guess in some people you say a sandbox and I'm sure from, I'll, I'll say for Isaac, they consider a sandbox just a fake system. So it's their production system, but it has fake data, stuff like that. Does that sound fair? Yeah, that sounds more fair. Um, I consider a sandbox any system where you can kind of play with the data, and that's why you're, you're fenced in. You can play, you can do whatever you want, and at the end of the day, it's not real patient data, it's not affecting a workflow, it's not doing any of that kind of stuff. And so, you know, when we talk about the Foundry specifically, it's to stand up these sandboxes. It's to say, here is a test server. This is not supposed to be something you're using in production. It might be production software, but you're using it in a context that is fenced in and just a playground. Um, whereas a reference server is more, in my mind, about the features and how you've built in those things. So for instance, in my reference servers, I go through Smart App Launch. I don't even ask for a username and password. I just give you a set of tabs that say, here are patients, here's practitioners, or here's the admin user. Pick one. Uh, because I want to make sure we're clearly <laughs> delineating, like we're not logging in as an actual user. This is just for testing, and you need to test if you're a patient or a practitioner or the admin. Uh, and you can test all those things without making it look like a real server. Um, does that help clarify? We can keep chatting after. Yeah. <laughs> all right. No, I, I don't think it is at all. It's, it's hard because they are, you know, I won't say they're, or, they're orthogonal. There's a lot of overlap, you know, they're not straight lines. Yeah, well, yeah, they're not straight lines. And so there's a lot of overlap. But yeah, sandbox is just play stuff, and any of those systems can be one of those. So sandbox has data or reference implementation? Uh, yeah, so a sandbox is generally the thing that has the implementation, some sort of software, and some sort of data, or that you can submit data to, or whatever, and then the actual software can be any of those three buckets. That's how I look at it. Yes, and sorry. we got a couple minutes left, so yep. this might be the last question. Hi. Hi. Um, so would you, you mentioned like ideally there should be at least two implementers. Yes. Uh, can we use that term loosely? So, so yeah. for context, right now we're piloting mm -hmm. with in, uh, pharmaceutical industry participants, yeah. uh, kind of a portion of our reference implementation, the core fire yeah. part. Um, and 
there isn't any existing, we're basically just saying figure out how, you know, we're, we're trying to see if people can make quick adaptations to their existing tools and get messages that are here to our IG and submit them and we'll problem solve it and improve yeah. our IG. Uh, so many of them, some of them are using little hacks with tools. So, yep. you know, like what, anyway. Yeah. Uh, and others, I think we'll be finding out more, are, are actually, you know, doing it manually in a way, which is mm -hmm. probably less than ideal. Yeah. But is that, do you so, think that's at least covering the general? Because these are all external and they are new to our IG. So yeah. that might be the key thing it's, you're talking about. Yeah, and I'll say it's, again, I hate to use all this, but it's very fuzzy stuff. Uh, so when we talk about that, I would put most of, those, most of that type of implementation into the prototype or mock stuff. Uh, and again, that's gonna be the most common at a lot of connectathons and things like that because you're talking to a company that has production software they're not in there building production code for your IG for a connectathon. They're putting in some sort of process, whether it's manual or hacky code, janky code, whatever your term you want to use, uh, prototype code. And that's not, a, that's not the implementation that they're going to go live with. And so those are kind of the distinctions, like you can say that can get to the point of a reference implementation where you're saying, yeah, we're actually servicing requests and we're doing things that's not manual. You know, we start including all those types of things. Uh, but to me, a reference server needs to be there available long term and provide that kind of feedback. So, and the more implementers, the better, because yeah, we're all only human. Yes, we have sorry. time for a last question. Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah, perfect. So I'm an IG author, not yes. a software developer. Of course. Um, and often it's I develop the IG and then I hand it to the developers. Yes. We're not in the same organization, so yeah. we're not that close. So do you have any advices for me on what I can do as an IG author to make it easier for you as a software developer to implement my requirements? Yes. Um, I hope there were some in here, uh, and I, I try to do both sides. I do. I am an IG author and I am an uh, implementer, and I'll say you know some of the specific things like when we talk about operations. Uh, I can't tell you the number of operations I've seen that it's just the operation definition that here are the inputs, here are the outputs, and like one line of text, the name of the operation. Like okay, well that's not really implementable. Um, so things like that, um, and then really a lot of it comes back to communication. So when you hand it off. Say, hey, whatever you run into, the stumbling blocks you find, you know, don't, you know, that's fine if you just figure out how to solve the problem, but at least let me know. Uh, one of the parallels I draw is uh, I used to run in a previous role uh, the engineering team. And uh, this is for DICOM stuff and whatever, and customers would have a problem, and often support would come to the engineers and say, hey, customers have this problem. They'd say, okay, well, here, get them up and running. Here's a SQL script that they can run. Just run this and it'll be fine. And then 10, 20, 30, 50 customers a day would call in with that same problem and support would just hand them the SQL script. Okay, well we don't know that we're having 50 customers a day that are having this problem. As developers, we heard about it once and never heard about it again. So we don't prioritize fixing it because we never heard about it. And so that's the kind of stuff like, that's fine, you can make it up, you can solve whatever you need to solve, you can go research, reading other context, but if you can get that feedback and then iteratively get it in, that's unfortunately the best advice I think I can give there. And I think we're over time, but I will hang around and I'm here all week, try the veal. So uh, please feel free to bug anytime and reach out to me however is convenient for you. Thank you. <laughs>